Good morning, and welcome to uh, St. Paul, United Church of Christ, Keokuk. <laughs> if they'll hurry up, do you think they'll run forward? They will do. Uh-huh, I'm thinking that they will. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh, sure. Well, have a seat while we wait a little bit. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about angels. And have you ever seen an angel? You haven't seen an angel? No? Well, maybe one of them has seen an angel. I thought there was only one of them, but there are two. Now there are three, and they're all running. Uh huh. Uh huh. And the last one is practicing <laughs> running. Uh huh. You bet. We've got flashing lights, too. Is that a little angel coming down here? Oh. Got diverted off to the dad and mom. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Uh huh. All right. Let's see if any of these have seen an angel. Have you seen an angel? No. No, you haven't seen an angel? No. Oh, well. Some people in the Bible see angels. Did you know that? Yeah, and yes, we're going to use this. And actually, Mary saw an angel as a messenger that came to her when Jesus was going to be born. What do you think about that? Uh-huh, I agree. And there were other angels that came as messengers. Sometimes the angels will protect you. You just write, say thank you. Thank you! Yes. Thank you to God and praise to God because the angels will protect you. Praise God. Say that. Pray. Praise God, not pray. Let's hear it. Praise God. Lift your arms up in the air. Just like that. Say praise God. Praise God. And make a bunch of little Pentecostals here. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, now, angels... Angels will provide us with all sorts of things. And uh, there is a story. There is a story, possibly about angels, that occurs in Joplin, Missouri. Do you know where Joplin, Missouri is? What? That's where they had what seemed to be angels during a tornado, protecting them. <laughs> and you know what? The only people who could see it were who? Can you say it? Kids. Kids! That's right, kids. I like your enthusiasm. Stop. Uh-huh. Yes. Now, I want you to thank God for angels, okay? So you're going to help me, okay? Now, what I want you to do <laughs> is hang on to this, and you just follow my hand. Thank you. Thank you. Lord. Lord. Come on over here. you got help. Come on. You got to come over here. If you're going to be a good Pentecostal preacher, you got to move around. Thank you, Lord, for angels. Thank you, Lord, for angels. Who protect us. Yes, who protect us. Go ahead. Who protect us. And help us. And help us. Now turn to the congregation and hold that microphone up and say, Amen. Amen. Very good. Okay, you can go back to your pew now. Always glad to train a future preacher, but I think we have a Pentecostalist who's coming up here. So. On Sunday, May 22, 2011, an EF five tornado devastated Joplin, Missouri, and it was late in the afternoon, and the destructive wind of that tornado tore into the town with incredible force. They have pictures of it. There's a big, wide funnel. There was not much left. The trees were stripped. The houses were turned to rubble, and the rubble was churned into itself so that it was difficult for people to even recognize their neighborhoods. 
And what happened was that uh, they went back to their neighborhoods and, and it really, really looked bad. But there was something else that happened and that was very strange. There were stories of butterfly people. Now, <clears throat> these uh, emerged after the tornado and they emerged from the children. The adults didn't really see anything. But they were, according to the kids, butterfly people who held up people who got swept up by the wind. There were butterfly people who, in this one instance, when uh, a parent and their child was uh, sitting there and, and trying to protect themselves and, and a vehicle was actually coming toward them, the vehicle stopped, it never did hit them. And uh, the little kid said, weren't they pretty, Mom? I said, what? The butterfly people holding it back. Now this is odd stuff, you know, but nevertheless, there were separate stories. There was a story of a child who was in a hospital and then uh, was found miles away from the hospital, apparently carried there, according to her. Well, the so stories of butterfly people, very odd. Sometime you'll have to look it up on the internet and, uh, and you'll see some of the stories there. They're stories originating from children. The adults saw nothing. It's not the only time, however, that butterflies have had a role in extreme circumstances. In a Nazi concentration camp in World War II, there are many, many images of butterflies carved into the walls in a camp in Poland. And oddly enough, is, <clears throat> oddly enough, it was children who carved them into the walls with stones and fingernails. In his poem titled Butterfly, Pavel Friedman, wrote of the despair of living in the ghetto where everybody was um, gathered by the Nazis. And uh, he said he saw one butterfly and then it left because butterflies don't live in the ghetto. His was a story more of despair, but it still centered on a butterfly and he was visited by one butterfly. Listen to his poem. The last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow. Perhaps if the sun's tears could sing against a white stone, such, such a yellow is carried lightly way up high. It went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks I've lived in here, penned up inside this ghetto. But I have found my people here, the dandelions call to me, and the white chestnut candles in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here, in the ghetto. He would later die in Auschwitz, and this is a story based on the anguish and and uh, based on the despair of living in a ghetto. Yet even there, in the depth of his sorrow and despair, he was visited by a butterfly. Those images of butterflies that are carved in the walls of the concentration camp, images that I spoke of earlier, are found in a building housing children in the Maidenek concentration camp in Poland. In addition, we now have a project called the Butterfly Project in which butterflies <clears throat> made by many people and sent in are used to commemorate the 1.5 million children killed in the Holocaust. So the butterfly, through the Butterfly Project, people from many places make butterflies and they're beautiful. You can also look that up on the internet. The Butterfly Project represented to, representative of children killed 
in the camps. But returning, let's return to the butterflies of Joplin. I suppose that we could write them off as the fanciful imagination of children. You know, those were extreme circumstances. I once thought to myself, gee, you know, I'd, just for the experience, I would like to actually, uh, you know, be in a tornado. I'll bet it'd be exciting. Well, the world turns upside down. The world in there is not the same as your world that you experience every day. My mother was in a severe tornado, and she saw all of the terrible things that happened during that tornado because there happened to be a clear window for some reason in the shelter that they were in, and she saw the men holding down the doors to the top of the shelter and barely able to do so during the course of the tornado. She was in a really bad tornado. So it isn't surprising, is not that children might have a kind of an imagination during that time because the world had become unreal anyway. Straws driven into posts by the force of the wind. The world turned upside down. Extreme circumstances, but that happened to be a place also where people believed, a lot of people believed. It happened to be in a kind of a faith belt. I suppose it's possible that it was the active imagination of children, yet some of the rescue workers felt that there must have been something protecting the people because in that kind of de devastation, actually, there should have been more casualties than there were. Perhaps those reports were only the imagination of children. Yet I like to think that an angel would look like a butterfly <clears throat> for a child unacquainted with angels. I'd like to think that only the children saw the butterfly people because they don't have the filters that adults have. Adults see what we expect to see. We don't really look for the unexpected. <clears throat> We've learned to see things. Children haven't. I would also like to think that during periods of extreme distress, angels really do come. And maybe they look like butterflies. But there is a kind of a comfort that comes, and I think it might be because of uh, angels who come and protect us and help us through what we must endure. The messengers of God. The angel means messenger. And I like to think that they're there helping us and protecting us. Sometimes we think of guardian angels, for example. Guardian angels who are with us in times of great distress. But there was one thing about those children and, and how they referred to those how they referred to those entities that they saw. They said they were beautiful. And that kind of adds a kind of a new overlay over what we usually think of in terms of angels. I think of angels as someone in white robes and they got wings in the back and those are white too. Well, maybe it's not like that. Maybe God has adorned them to look beautiful. Maybe like butterflies. Why not? Why not? Because after all, after all, God makes beautiful butterflies. Why would the angels not look beautiful in that way? <clears throat> the children were struck by the beauty of those things that they saw. And so then what we what we see might be an act of imagination, but I like to think that uh, it was beautiful angels who were protecting people, and the casualties there should have been much higher. But they were not. Children are open to seeing things, and we're missing out on a lot in our faith when we are not open. <clears throat> and children also trust 
quite often without any questions, without any skepticism, that sort of thing. They trust people to protect them. They cling to people to shelter them. And they look for that kind of stuff that would bring order to a chaos that they're in. And possibly God provides that. But you see, we have to be open too. And that's what we learn as children. We have to be open and we have to be trusting in the same way in relation to God. But as adults, <clears throat> we've learned what to see. We know what's real. We know what's not real. We're closed to a lot of things because we've just learned over time not to see those things. But in relation to God, we need to be completely open like children. I learn from children all the time. Hand them a cell phone, they'll learn to work it. Children are open, they're trusting. And in relation to God, uh, Jesus often said we have to be like children. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. We need to be like children. We need to be open. We need to be trusting. We need to be able to see what God has to offer to us. In the same way that children are open, children are trusting. They can see what God has to offer to them. Whether it's protection, whether it's new insight into their lives, when you have children in Sunday school and you tell them the stories of Jesus, they learn to love Jesus. They learn to love Jesus as if they were walking by Jesus' side and completely trust Jesus. And we as adults can learn that as well. We can learn that as well. We can learn how to see again through the eyes of a child. How many of you have enjoyed as adults seeing a child experience something for the first time. And we remember our own wonderment and openness when we saw it for the first time. And we sometimes wish that we could go back to that, that kind of simplicity. And before God, we can. We can go back to the simplicity and openness of a child. Be open, be simple, be as a child in loving God. If we're open, we can see how God cares for us. And if we're open, then we can begin to accept that care and have a certain amount of fearlessness in relation to God. Going forward with our mission as a church, going forward with our lives, just kind of a fearlessness about things. That might be the point of a story which we find in Mark, and it's a story in which uh, the disciples, who were close followers of Jesus, were closed off by fear. We read in Mark, one day when evening came, he said to the disciples, take us over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And we're going to ask ourselves every day, why are you so afraid? Some of the children of Joplin turned to their adults who were with them, parents, and said during the course of seeing these things that, that they say they saw, don't worry. With a kind of a calm, they said, don't worry. Don't worry, Mom. Because they saw or felt 
the kind of calm that God wants us to have. You see, Jesus calmed the waves and the wind. And Jesus, if Jesus can calm the waves and the wind, Jesus can also calm the storms of our souls. How often do those storms blow up into our, our souls and there are winds and waves because we're fearful. Our souls are turbulent. If Jesus could calm the storm, Jesus can calm our souls as well. And we can feel that same kind of assurance which some of the children had in Joplin. Don't worry. The wind is blowing at 200 miles per hour. I think I've got something to worry about. And here's this little kid going, don't worry because they see something. <clears throat> you see, if we're open to God, we trust God. If we're open to God and trust God, we need not fear. We need not fear anything. We can be fearless in following the mission that God has for us because we have the assurance that God is walking with us every step of the way that God is exercising care for us. And if we're in that storm of the soul, God is saying exactly what Jesus said to his, his disciples. Why are you so fearful? What's the matter? What's the matter with your faith? Why are you so fearful? I can just see 200 mile an hour winds Things flying all over the place. As a matter of fact, for one person, the wind just pulled the soles right off his shoes. And again, no other injury. And again, the sense that there was uh, a present there. If we're open to God and we trust God, we need never fear. President Franklin D. Roosevelt <coughs> addressing our nation, said the following, the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. And that's true in our faith, too. We have faith and we have fear. Now, we are imperfect. We are often in fear even though we have faith. God through, through our prayers, helps us actually to be more confident and calms the soul. But actually, see, those two don't seem to go together. They're what they're called in English, an oxymoron. You have faith or you have fear. Now, we're imperfect. We call on God to, ask, to help us with our fear because, you know, sometimes we just feel like we can't help but feel it, and then we can feel a kind of calm. And I've felt it before. After you pray, God comes with a kind of calm. It's unexplainable, really. You know, it's kind of odd. You pray to God, look, God, I've, I'm full of turmoil. And then a kind of a calm sometimes comes. And you're going forward more confidently. <clears throat> fear and faith. When you have fear and you're a person of faith, call on God in prayer. Because that's the time when you need the strength of God to overcome the fear. But I can tell you what God's going to say. God's going to say to you, Okay, why are you so afraid? Where's your faith? But God is going to help you because God knows that we are weak. If we're open to God, we trust God. If we're open to God, we trust God. Now, we might add that in relation to fear, we are not knowledgeable enough to fear because we are very limited in our knowledge. 
It would make sense, I suppose, to exercise fear if we actually knew everything. And it's a good thing we don't, because then we'd be even more fearful. Oh, what about this? What about that? The whatabouts. But we don't know enough. We know very little, really. I'm often reminded, you know, Kim will remind me quite often of all the things I don't know. You know? (laughs) There are many things that I don't know. For example, I did not know that there was a container of Parmesan cheese that was open in the refrigerator, and I opened a new one. Terrible thing to do. (laughs) I I know you're just cringing at the the thought. Our, our knowledge is so limited. How can we possibly fear and know what we're doing? Our knowledge is so limited. We're, we're so limited in what we really know about things. That's what God is telling Job. <clears throat> Job is saying, well, you know, things ought to be this way and things ought to be that way, and I'm disappointed and that sort of thing. Calling God to account... Listen to what God says. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds to garment and wrapped it in thick darkness when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. Where were you? God is the only one who has comprehensive enough knowledge to know whether or not we ought to be fearful of something. And God will protect us in those times. We don't know enough. We're limited in knowledge, so limited that we can't really know what we're doing when we fear. If we're open to God and trust God, we need not fear. God traces out the limits of what Job knows in this passage. We, not li- we need not live in fear, for we can rely on God's knowledge. God's love and care may have been expressed in the butterfly people of Joplin, Missouri. And I suppose if you haven't seen an angel, you don't know what they look like, they might look like butterfly people. I suspect that there are a few butterflies around us every day of our lives because God loves us. When we're experiencing illness and uncertainty, I suspect that there are few butterflies around. When we're experiencing disappointment, I expect that there are a few butterflies. We can count on God to make sure that we have the comfort that we need. Come to God without fear. Come to God like a child. And maybe, just maybe, you'll see those butterflies, those guardian angels with whom God is protecting us. Amen. You have been listening to St. Paul United Church of Christ, 2030 Plank Road, Keokuk. Join our worship service at 10 a.m. with fellowship hour immediately following. Until next week, may God bless.